Good morning. Welcome to News File. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. I'm Samson Ladia Yenini. NDC Chairman Johnson Asiedun Katia accuses government of compromising the security services by handing security agency jobs to party foot soldiers. The Interior Minister, Henry Corte, eventually admits asking MPs, NDC MPs, to submit names of constituents for recruitment, except there was no intention to bribe the NDC MPs. This is not new. The Ayawasu West Wagon Eminent Committee findings confirmed security services are employment avenues for party foot soldiers who are promised during campaigns. Both parties are guilty as charged. MPP vigilante groups have had cause to beat up people to the point of killing them, even publicly, over non-fulfillment of such campaign promises to give them those jobs. But what are the implications of the developments as two Dankwa Institute guys are said to be appointed to head or insensitive positions in two key national security agencies. At the time, Brian Champon is accused of stoking tensions. And that's the man who was accused of the Ayawaso West brutalities. He's accused of stoking tensions ahead of the 2024 elections. Three times he has repeated that they will not hand over power. Really? Government issues far-reaching directives to protect and preserve public lands. In the wake of a crusade by Samuel Okujetua Blackwa against what he says is the wanton grab land grab by politically exposed persons, particularly in the Akufuado administration. These are the people for whom he is pursuing a law to prohibit from acquiring public lands. We interrogate the evidence that Okujetua Blackwa has over the denial by government of any wrongdoing. Tomorrow, the NPP launches its manifesto. Bold solutions, Dr. Bahamia says. The NDC will also launch its manifesto in full on the 24th, we understand. But ahead of that, the NDC did a launch of what he calls its youth manifesto. A number of issues coming up in that manifesto. Free fees, they say no stress, for people who have gained admission to tertiary institutions for the first year. How is this feasible? There will be a scrapping of e-levy, betting tax, among others. We are broke. Where will they find the money? We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. This is Newsfile, the almost authoritative news analysis platform. And here on Newsfile, what we do is to put Ghana first. And here's my five minute stake, Samson's stake. Yes, we need a third force. Yeah, we do need a third force. I don't know. If that third force in our political space will be Alan Chiramantin's group, the Movement for Change, now morphed into the Alliance of Revolutionary Change. 
I seem to believe that these small groups of political organizations can make a positive impact if they are able to rally together. The CPP, PNC, PPP, all of them. They should be able to be forward looking and thinking, knowing that the duopoly that has disappointed this country for all these years, the NDC and NPP, will not be removed by their single individual efforts, but by their collective strength. And by giving Ghanaians a sense that they can unite behind the goal to develop this country and meaningfully and not seeking individual goals. <clears throat> the Movement for Change, Alan Chamantin's group, they say among other things that they are seeking to advocate for a non-partisan approach to electing the president. Imagine if we ever got there, a non-partisan approach to electing the president, where there will be prioritization of the interests of Ghana over political affiliations. Very soon we'll get into the discussions, the questions of land grabbing, the questions of undermining the security agencies by putting just partisans in there. And you will discover that this will be a good idea. When the government began a plan after a promise of non-partisan election of district assemblies and decided to abandon it, but chose that it has to be done, but done on political lines. That's what Akufuadu projected. When we began the campaign against it, the party supported it, regardless that there are many in there who believe that the non-partisan approach as practiced by other developed countries is the best for this country because the partisanship is killing this country. When the government went to seize excavators and set them ablaze, even the attorney general who knows the law, which prescribes what should be done when excavators are seized, that they should be impounded, kept in the police station, after a trial, if the people are found guilty, Police will give custody back and the state will distribute these machines to those state institutions that need their use. Even the attorney general, who knows the law, defended the reckless, unconstitutional and lawless conduct of the government. The lands minister is a lawyer. He defended it. He was the one prosecuting that unlawful and illegal agenda in a democracy where rule of law must hold sway. When I spoke about it, I got attacked by the party people. Recently, when Dr. Baumia said, they have a change of mind, they will not do that anymore. All he was saying was, I will now obey the law. His party didn't go at him and attack him because he's party person. I'm not party person. So it's okay to attack me and insult me. When Henry Corte, as regional minister, got a task that lined people up on the streets, whipped them, including the elderly, because they were not using a footbridge, they made them sweep. They, sw they swept dusty places. He won't put his own mother through that. There were mothers who were doing that. He won't put his father through that. There were fathers who were doing that. Guess what? For not using the footbridge, country Ghana has a law on what to do. 
he completely abandoned it and became the law unto himself. He became the prosecutor and the judge. That does not happen in a democracy. When I spoke about it, the MPP people said, go to court. What am I going to court for? I will criticize when you do the wrong thing. I don't have to go to court. I don't have to spend my money to go to court. So, the democracy is hijacked by the partisans. And once they win power, they see the largesse of states as spoils of war that they must distribute among themselves. That's where the issues of land grab, contract soul sourcing, which are so unconscionable, happen in this country. So, to advocate for a nonpartisan approach to electing the president, prioritizing the interests of Ghana over political affiliations is a good thing. They say they will champion the establishment of a government of national unity, inclusive of diverse interest groups to ensure governance that represents all sectors of society. I don't know exactly how they will achieve that, but it is doable to the extent that the politics partisanship is killing this country. We do need that. They will seek to construct a national development plan that transcends individual party manifestos, fostering a cohesive vision for our nation's progress. They aim to inspire a positive shift in the behavior and attitudes of Ghanaians, laying the foundation for national development. I say, we do need a third force that will embody these ideals. I don't know if Alan and his group can do it, but I suspect that they may, if they're able to coalesce all the other smaller parties together, Ghanaians might think otherwise, because it is doable. And I pray that we will all encourage such minor groupings. Encourage them. You never know what they can do for this country. The president put his presidency on the line over Galamse. Today, Erasmus Asaridonko continues to report to us the devastation continues unabated. The president is in office. This is my take. Be right back. You're welcome back. This is News File, it's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. I'm Samson Ladi Anyenini. And I'm joined by my guest to begin discussing the issues that flooded the front pages of your mind in the course of the week. We begin with the NDC's Youth Manifesto, lunch on the occasion of International Youth Day. And we are asking the very central question. They say they are going to pay for the fees of persons who get admitted to tertiary institutions, public tertiary institutions, for the first year, because they know that that has become a problem. And as you see many times, we, we hear being advertised everywhere, somebody has gotten how many A's, They've got the best of results, but they cannot go. <clears throat> and so we are mobilizing funds publicly to help such people. Uh, they are crunching the numbers and suggesting that there are many, many people who are unable to go to university or tertiary institutions because they simply cannot afford the fees to start with. How are they going to fund this? That's the biggest question now. How are they going to fund it? As for the NPP, the question they ask them is, if you don't believe in free SHS, why are you seeking to do something for free, really? Joining us is Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, MP North Town and Chairman, Assurance Committee of Parliament and Member Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament. Remember, he was in this ministry of education. Also joining us 
is Reverend John Intim Fodjo, MP Ascent South and Deputy Minister for Education. Dr. Theo Champong is economist and political risk analyst. He will stand right in the middle and crunch the hard, cold facts and numbers without putting politics to it. Nanaya Achempen Jantua is former General Secretary of the Convention People's Party, CPP. Lady and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. And I chanced on this thing yesterday, publication that there are, there are calls on you to form a party and you say you won't form a party. Mm. <laughs> so those smaller, smaller things. You don't have to deepen the crisis of the Nkrumah's front. They don't help, those smaller, smaller things. They don't. The Nkrumah's front is split. They need to come together. Yes. When will that happen? I believe after 2025, we'll, we'll let them have their problem. Let us all have the fights and everything. It will be levelized. Because as I was saying, when you look on the ballot paper, seven parties. Now, if I add my friend um, Janet's own to it, it becomes seven. Seven parties are from the Nkrumah stock. Mm. Former members, almost all of them former members or or from the stock. Mm. So can you imagine seven parties, if we consolidate all our resources, all our efforts together, wouldn't we make an impact? We also have a very good brand. We're expecting a certain internal renewal within the Young two companies. parties, that's in the Duopoly, MDC, MPP. They must, they must reflect, inflect, reform. Otherwise, yes, otherwise, they can't get people like us. Mm -hmm. And I was telling the story the other day. The, there was this election. I was voting in Osu. I voted for Zenato Rawlings okay. as the NP candidate. And I voted for Dr. Papa Kwesi Hindu. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? I'm just tired of the two. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to another constituency in Dan Suman. I voted for Bridget Jubanuku mm -hmm. and voted for Esla Osu Ekofo. I feel there are people like me who will encourage you guys if you come together. I, I was telling Papa Kusindum, Dr. Papa Kusindum, that he shouldn't have left if he had stayed within. I mean, by now, maybe he would have been a formidable force mm. as Papa Kusindum on the CPP ticket to fight the geopoly. And it, it, it would have been done. Mm. He, maybe by now, he wouldn't be fighting for his property and all that. Mm. It, anyway. It's sad, but. We will get there. Mm. Heaven knows that we will get there. Right. I believe 2025, mm. okay. the CPP will come together as a force. And going forward, 2028, we are going to win an election in this country. We see Prat uh, Kukubaku Jr. have been preaching that the Nkrumah's front, you need to come together to sponsor MP candidates. Yes. Then you, form, you, form, you, make, you get a formidable base yes. to begin to sp you yes. know, sprint from. Anyway, <laughs> uh, some of us, we call him son of man. <laughs> Samuel Okujato Ablakwa. Hi. Um, Good to see you, Samson. And you have I, been a thorn in the flesh uh, to, to, to the government, and many have been excited at what you are doing. But we'll interrogate your evidence. Always. I'm always ready to provide the evidence the good people of Ghana decide. As I always say, all of this is for God and country. Right. But I just want to uh, also reflect on the CPP discussion. Mm -hmm. And for those of us in the two big parties of the Fourth Republican Dispensation, let us remember that none of us has achieved what the CPP achieved. It still remains the most successful political party in history. Check the results of the 1951 elections. The 38 seats that were available for elections, the CPP won 34. UGCC won only three, and then won by an independent candidate. 34. 95% of the total votes. NDC, MPP, we have never achieved that. And yet look at the CPP today. So the lesson is that as people call for reforms, people call for a new way of doing politics, 
Sometimes some of the things we do, you find even some of your own party people call you that, oh, some of these laws you are proposing, oh, you know, you, when it's becoming clear that power is coming, then you want to tighten things and make things difficult for us. It is almost our turn. We cannot continue like that. So it becomes, you know, uh, a race to the abyss. Mm. Um, so it's about how worse you were. Oh, you did some. And even this debate we'll be having on mm. state capture, they struggle to look for some mistakes of the past. Then they say, oh, we are all the same. We are all Dukadaya. <laughs> so why are you talking? Keep quiet. So nobody should talk. Let's not think about the progress of our country, the, mm. the, 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 the forward nature that we should pursue, that should transform our society. Let's remember where the CPP was in 1951 and where it is today. So right. you either reform, make sure that your policies, your politics right. is in tandem mm. to the hopes and aspirations of the people, or you perish. Right. I, I, I like that. You reform or you perish. And if you follow the Afrobarometer surveys, if you follow even international organizations doing surveys, there is now the talk about the democratic recession. The people are losing faith in the democratic project, you know, because they are not getting the dividends of democracy. So like Samuel Kujato said, if you won't reform, look, your days are numbered. Don't think it will always be MPP, NDC, no matter what, we have the numbers to win election after every eight years. Right. Thank you very much. Now, let's get to the free academic fees. Let's hear the NDC at their youth manifesto launch. Many young people are eager and ready to work. But the struggle to find employment is a huge challenge. The rising unemployment rate, which currently stands at a staggering 14.7%, was worsened by the recent banking sector cleanup, which led to widespread job losses, especially among the banking and finance prof professionals. Other statistics that show the dire situation of Ghanaian youth is a 21.7% youth unemployment rate. Many young people are eager and ready to work, but the 8 million Ghanaians who went a day without food last year, and many of them young people, and you heard about 001 and 100 and 010. In my commitment to establish a dedicated ministry for youth development, this ministry will centralize the coordination of youth initiatives in Ghana it will facilitate job creation, it will promote entrepreneurship, it will provide scholarships and enhance youth participation in decision making. While ensuring, while ensuring the effective implementation of the National Youth Authority Act. Despite various initiatives, a significant gap still exists between the skills offered by educational institutions and the demands of our job market. Only about 10% of our young people receive formal skills training and thereby hampering their employability and their economic prospects. This current situation is detrimental to innovation and economic growth and particularly affecting artisans and craftsmen who need access to modern tools and training. And therefore, to address these shortcomings, the next NDC government will partner with religious bodies and other non-governmental organizations to invest in diverse skills development programs to enhance the economic opportunities that are available to our young people. And so, the National Apprenticeship Program, which is NAP, NAP, and the expanded TVET centers will provide skills upscaling for youth who do not progress to the tertiary level. Political bias and nepotism have tarnished the recruitment processes within Ghana's security services and our public sector. This undermines trust in public institutions and creates disillusionment amongst our youth. That um, it is a very good thing from the NDC, most especially the um, 
um, presidential candidate for the NDC, John Damani Mahama, for you know such an innovative idea. But I think that um, even though the policy is feasible, there are a lot more that we know we can um, think about just so to be able to make the um, policy more practical than it appears to be. I think that um, I'll, I'll talk from you know different angles. The fact that um, in terms of accessibility to the tertiary education will be you know very easy because students who are unable to you know pay for the academic fees at the level 100 will be able to you know get themselves enrolled into our tertiary schools and then the burden on their parents and even themselves to you know um, enroll burden on. Um, on parents and students who even pay the fees themselves. So I'm also taking it from this angle. What about the continuing students who are already in the system? Um, you know, it's something that is going to attract votes. You know, these promises will definitely attract some votes. But I'm also thinking about what about the continuing students who are already in the system? What will be their concerns? Are they not going to say it's um, a promise that is neglecting them, putting them at a certain angle? and neglecting them, focusing on students who are rather coming into the tertiary. I actually think in a way it's going to help since people got graduate with higher grades, which actually fit to be in the universities, but due to lack of money from parents, they are unable to pursue their education. Right. So let's begin with uh, Samuel Okujetua Blackwa. Uh, so we can say from the youth policy, the top five promises, uh, no academic fees for level 100 students, reduce data cost, train one million youth in coding, establish Ministry of Youth Development, and scrap betting tax. But our focus here is the no academic uh, fees. Uh, what, what informs this kind of policy. Well, thank you very much. First of all, let me commend our youth wing. Uh, they have really um, brought in uh, a lot of uh, verve, inspiration, energy. Um, they have been absolutely amazing with the kind of in, uh, initiatives that they have uh, been pursuing under the leadership of uh, lawyer Opariado who we all call Pablo. Mm -hmm. and, um, I've really been impressed with the uh, kind of uh, leadership that he has brought to bear. And I want to salute him and the entire youth wing of our, of our party. Of course, the folks who worked on the youth uh, manifesto, young people, and I like the selection. And that's why you can see that the, um, the policies that have been agreed by the party and the flag bearer are really resonating with young people. So the party did not ask um, very elderly, you know, well-established party people who, you know, are not part of that age bracket, who are not feeling what the youth are feeling, to go draft a youth manifesto for the youth. We selected young people. So you have reps from the student leaders, from youth associations. Um, I saw the likes of uh, the first female SRC president of the law school on that committee, various SRC executives, you know, a refreshing, you know, selection of young people. And you saw the presentations that they made, you know, and I'm not surprised that many young people, and you see, if you look at the population of our country, Ghana has a youthful population. We have a youth bulge. And if democracy... It's an African situation. Exactly. And, and, and if democracy really is about pursuing the hopes and, major, and wishes of the majority, making sure that, you know, um, the vast majority of our people, are, uh, their interests are pursued and we seek their welfare, then this is the approach. So I want to salute all of them for the good job they have done. Now to answer your question directly, I want to submit forcefully that this is a policy grounded under the 1992 constitution. If you look at Article 25 of our Constitution, Article 25 presents what should be the vision of education in Ghana and what all governments should do to achieve that vision. So Article 25 provides 
all persons shall have the right to equal educational opportunities and facilities, and with a view to achieving the full realization of that right. A, basic education shall be free, compulsory, and available to all. So f -cube, we have largely you know, rolled that out since the era of President Rawlings, President Kufuo, and successive governments have continued with f -cube. Then B, secondary education in its different forms, including technical and vocational education, shall be made generally available and accessible to all by every appropriate means, and in particular by the progressive introduction of free education. This has also been largely achieved. You recall that President Mahama launched the Progressively Free, President Akufuado deepened it, and uh, uh, we have the free SHS, which all parties have committed to. We all say that free SHS has come to stay. Indeed, one of the, 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 the policy proposals is, that was presented on this platform is to not only uh, address the challenges, uh, the challenges with uh, you know, uh, lack of facilities, lack of infrastructure, lack of dormitories, lack of textbooks, to address all of that, but also expand it to now cover private secondary schools. Because remember that private secondary schools... Which was one of your criticisms yes. at the introduction of the yes, program. Yes, exactly. That it was not, you know... Um, uh, equitable so enough. Because the taxes used for the free SHS, you made the contention, are taxes of all Ghanaians. all Ghanaians. And so it should not be limited only to public institutions. Exactly, exactly. Especially as the private schools... But, but that, that appears to run counter with your argument that free HSS, SHS should have been graduated in a manner of needs assessment. So not everybody should have it for free. You see, the view we take is that even in the private schools, you'll still find people who don't really have all the means are not privileged. You know, so don't close the door. So even with a needs assessment, we are saying that it could have been done across the board, public and, and private. Okay, to avoid so, deviation. Yeah. Yeah, let's go on. Then many people forget about Article 25.1c. And as a former NUCS president, mm -hmm. I recall that we always trumpeted this, you know, in our days as student activists. So Article 25 c provides, higher education shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity by every appropriate means, and in particular, by progressive introduction of free education. That's Article 25 c So I've seen... A good number of Ghanaians on social media go agog that, oh, I mean, this is this not just about vote buying and um, is it not a sign of desperation? No. It is a constitutional provision that let's start with F cube, the basic. Let's get to secondary, make it progressively free. But let us also keep an eye on higher education. Research shows that there is a link between your population that has higher education and your GDP growth. If you have your human resource well educated at the highest of levels, you have good professionals, it has an impact on the development of your country. So you cannot have a situation where you have this huge you know, base, if you look at our educational structure, huge base. But by the time you are approaching secondary, going to tertiary, it becomes you know, a very narrow you know, pyramid at the top where only about 19 to 20% are able to get in. Now, the analysis we have done, and we've done the actuarial studies, close to 43,000 on a yearly basis who are given admission, students who have gained admission. We are not talking about those who have dropped out after SHS or who didn't meet the mark. They have met the mark, the entry requirements. They have gained admission, but because of lack of finances, they don't have the means, they are unable to take up that admission. Because to qualify, to register and enter, you must pay your admission fees. That is why when we were in power, if you recall, in 2016, President Mahama asked us to introduce what we call the Student Loan Plus. Because we observed that there are many people, and every now and then you see, as he rightly said, you know, Ghanaians 
on social media, you know, NGOs, civil society organizations, philanthropists, foundations, and even some radio stations had to institute programs. Um, students who sometimes second attempt, third attempt, they couldn't just raise the funds. They have made the grades, they have all the A's, straight A's, but they can't get in. Getting in, so critical, because if you don't get in, then you don't qualify for the student loan and other scholarship opportunities in the institutions. So getting in is a critical point. That is why we introduced the Student Loan Plus in 2016. But now we are saying that, let us have a general policy that helps everybody. I have heard people say, oh, you want them to get in in level 100 and then they drop out after level 200 to level 400. No, we are saying that getting in is a critical point. When they get in, they are now bona fides. They fully qualify for all the opportunities. We have the student loans. We have said that we are going to increase the student loan so that they can apply for the student loans. So that for first year, that one is a grant. Your admission fees, you will not pay back even when you have graduated and you start working. It is free, that's a grant. But for second year to your final year, if it's a four-year program or a five-year program or a seven-year program, depending on the course you are pursuing, you, know, you then will be on the student loan trust scheme. Mm. So it is not the case that we are only interested in you uh, getting in and we don't care if you drop out, no. We are going to increase access to the student loans. And you see, we've done the costing. This is not a policy where it's just, you know, a pie in the sky or we are just shooting from the hip, not at all. So that's a real issue now. Tell yes. us, where, so, where are you going to get the money from? So the costing we've done is between 250 to 300 million cities annually. And really, we are saying that two things must happen to the GET Fund. We must uncap it and then we must stop this Dachi bond thing, this collateralization. What does it mean, uncap the GET Fund? So the government introduced this capping law. And uh, what that law has done is that all the statutory funds, it has, it has created a ceiling. So not all the funds go to the agency. So whether it's GET Fund, it's NHIA, District Assembly Common Fund. So the capping has affected so get fund this year, let me just be very practical. This year, when we met as a house to approve the get fund formula, which we do every year, the get fund formula is how much has accrued to the get fund, how much is going to the get fund, and what will it be used for? Now, we were shocked to discover that because of capping and because of the Dachi bond obligations, even though 7 billion Ghana cities had accrued to the GET Fund, GET Fund got only 3 billion this year. So 4 billion lost. So we are saying that if we uncap GET Fund and we, 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 we move away from this collateralization of the fund, I mean, 4 billion instantly becomes available. But it is capped, not, you, you cannot really say lost because the capped funds is also still being put into development purposes. So that goes into the consolidated fund and it becomes the discretion of the mm. finance minister mm. on what to do with it. But you see, once you keep it within the education realm, then immediately you have more resources to focus on your educational needs. So we've done the analysis, we've done the costing, and we are saying that, look, 200 it's going to be get fund. To 300 million, yes. It's going to be get fund. Yes. Solely get fund. Largely, yes, largely get fund. I thought I heard Legit, the, not, not so. the president, Legit. the former president, emphasize, and your other communicators emphasize um, downsizing the presidency and realizing monies from there. That's a place you have also had have uh, yes. have had interest in. Absolutely, that the numbers are just too many, and uh, I think. They were actually making an estimation how much you can save sure, from there. Sure, and they also add even savings from fighting corruption, you know, hmm. uh, because you know, you know the data. Um, so, yes, we have looked at the wastage in the system, and I have done considerable work in that, in that space. If you take presidential travels alone, I mean, in, in nine months, President Kufuado can spend about 70 million cities. 
on just travels. Um, if you look at some of the expenditure patterns I've monitored, one cabinet retreat, for example, can take five million cities. If you see how much we spend on even the Independence Day celebrations, we've had a number of African presidents, like the former Tanzanian president, President Magafuli, is one of the presidents I have enormous respect for, who really stopped all of these razzmatazz about when you are having serious basic issues, you shouldn't be spending so much on those kinds. Just a little brief commemoration, and then you can save resources. The size of government, you know, there are many ministries that can go. Ghana should not have a separate ministry for, 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 for the aviation, aviation sector. Then we had for railways. Mm. Now we have railways separate. Well, you guys are talking then about transport. a total of 60 then you ministries. Have, uh, separate ministries for, uh, for, for mm. local government, okay. for water and sanitation. There are so many ministries that can put, be put together. Why should we have a separate ministry for chief So, so just, just and, a couple of questions. For tourism and all a, couple, that. a couple of questions for quick responses. So yeah. we go to Intim for you and then come to Nanaya. Now, the question about needs assessment. Yes. It's very practical with many designing people. Yes, people gain admission and they have issues. So here, even in multimedia, as you mentioned, there is a, you know, an education fund yes. that people have had to access to be able to go to school. But as the university uh, teachers, some of them also suggest, is it not the best way to target it rather than just say all persons who have gained admission to public institutions come for free money, you know, to start. There's, there's a lot of sense in because that. Because there are people who gain admission who can afford. There's a lot of sense in that argument. And our response is that inherent in this policy is that needs assessment where we have not done a blanket that throughout your first degree, we have said that level 100. Now, after level 100, the needs assessment kicks in. Those who would need the support go to the Student Loan Trust and other scholarship schemes. There's money would you would have given to... Scholarship secretariat. There's money you would have given to my son, yes. whom I can afford to pay more than twice for his fees at the university to start with. There's money you could have saved to take care of the poor who cannot afford for both the first year, second year, third year, and fourth year. Yes, so we, we are telling you that we have identified the source of funds. We are going to make sure funding is available. That would lead to an increase in subventions to our universities and other tertiary institutions, increase in allocation to the scholarship secretariat and allocations to the student loan trust fund. And then we are saying that after first year, those who really fall in that bracket of the vulnerable, the needy, can then access those funds. So that those who have genuine, legitimate concerns about needs assessment, that let's not just throw good money away. Let's so here you are. Assessment. Here you are. That the argument. That, that will be the argument you used. The argument you used against the blanket yes. approach to the free SHS policy is coming to haunt you. Well, and again, it, it depends on how you look. And at again, it, when you when you talk about, for for example, the 2020 2021 admissions. Mm -hmm. Uh, a total of um, 118,000 were admitted, as in offered admissions. Yeah. Out of that number, 74,970 honored the admissions. So the shortfall was 43,030 students. It is wrong to compute that all these 43,000 they didn't go to the university because they couldn't afford, is it not? Nobody has, has said that. Um, we, in, indeed, in our presentation, we said that um, there is a number of factors, there are a number of factors that you need to look at. So there is, the research shows that the majority don't go in because of fee challenges. Then there are those who uh, may just probably want to defer um, a few who may travel abroad and, 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 and all of that. Okay. But at least the analysis we have done mm. shows that at the very least, 
75 to 80 percent. It is because they just couldn't take up. And remember that these admissions come with deadlines. That's correct. You know, so if you are you're totally cut off, nothing can be done if you have say two weeks. So if by the 30th of August this month you have not been able to come up with the fees, the admission fees, that's it. All right. Um, you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are totally. So I, I will. I will return. Yeah. I will return so, and I will ask Nanaya if the the agenda shouldn't rather be targeting this 43,030 uh, who couldn't make it because they could not afford, or even a little above that, for people who are actually in so need, see, rather than the blanket general it, approach to the policy for first well, year. Some say, you see, your reliance on the 43,000 creates the impression that everybody who is in the other category had the means. Some may have come to multimedia, for example, to benefit from... I have paid for people, yes. myself. Or were lucky, you know, like the Catholic priest who, you know, Catholic priest of the Bato, uh, 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 St. Uh, Maria Goretti Catholic Parish, who rushed to me with this, you know, very sad story of a young lady who was going to miss the deadline to UMAT, you know, had only two days. She had sold you know, uh, KNK, but couldn't make up, you know. The that, that's a fact. In fact, in it many, is, in is, many of the parishes in the Catholic churches, yes. I, I know that yes. for a fact, yes. and, and they and have a fund that yeah. people yeah. access. But, but fund, we have heard about yeah. Pentecost and other places the in churches. Run out and right. they still have these. Okay, these so, so let's go to, let's go to Reverend Tim so, Fodjo. So it's, 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 um, Rev, it's thank you very yeah. much for making the time to join us uh, on this. Um, the N NPP must be must be thinking the NDC has beaten you to it, right? Because the constitutional injunction is that you do free education for the secondary and then tertiary progressively free. So they are saying, yes, you have sort of completed. That's how they want to say it. They don't want to say you take all the credit for starting free SHS. They started somehow and you have completed uh, that program, so to speak. So now that is a policy. But you need to move the next step. And we have been practicing this constitution for far too long. This should have happened long ago. So they are now introducing their progressively free agenda to higher learning. What do you say? Um, good morning, Samson. And uh, um, thank you very much for having me on your show. And uh, good morning to my very good friend, um, Honorable Kudetua Blakwa, and my dear sister, Ananaya Adanto, and of course, Professor Champon, uh, will be joining all our viewers. Um, good morning to you. Indeed, um, the thought of proposing an initiative for no fees for level 100 by, as proposed by the NDC, is a strong endorsement of NPP's position as superior when it comes to education. It is an exoneration of our diligent and visionary and consistent position we have maintained since um, 2008, our, our manifesto as contained um, on page 67 of, of our manifesto on our position on education, ensuring that access is increased at all levels and barriers to education, systemic economic barriers are dismantled. Consistently so from 2017, His Excellency Nana Okufuado and Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, the Vice President, have demonstrated inv massive investments across all sectors, and particularly dismantling barriers to access at the secondary level and dismantling barriers to access at the tertiary level. Um, the position of the NDC and in their proposal, and in, as contained in their youth manifesto, uh, particularly the No Fee Initiative, is far fetched. It says to many Ghanaians a knee-jerk approach. Uh, obviously, they have realized that every essential aspect of tackling education challenges have been already undertaken by the MPP, and therefore they, they need to struggle around to find where they can find space. The premise of the 43,000 um, supposed um, candidates or students who supposedly uh, again, admissions, but failed to 
report is, is, is not well grounded in the fact that um, one student averagely may apply to three, four universities. And so he's going to accept one. He's going to definitely enroll in one. Uh, on that, that issue, probably, on that issue, the statistics we just shared with you takes care of that. So we are talking about universities in Ghana. Yeah. The total no, number, the total number of, of, of admissions that was that were offered, the total number that uh, you know honored the admissions, and the total number that could not honor the admission. So this does not come in at Thompson, this point. Thompson, the, the, the scope of that uh, research, as you indicated, pertains to public universities. Is that that's, correct? That's correct. Very well. Thousands of students would apply for spaces in university, public, private universities. And then same student, a good number of them, who at the same time applied to colleges of education and applied to nursing and midwifery training colleges and other tertiary institutions, technical universities, and other categories of tertiary institutions that are not accounted for in this research. So that's a fundamental flaw upon which their initiative is premised. Again, their position on um, against free SHS right from 20, uh, particularly from 2012, 2016, have been consistent up until recent weeks, where we, we had a pronouncement by their flag bearer, a massive endorsement of the free SHS, and their decision to support free SHS. It has always been various criticism. At the matter of record, there are about 11 occasions where pronouncement had been made by pre former President Mahama and their key stalwarts speaking against free SHS. They had used words like free SHS is unintelligent policy, free SHS is a whimsical promise of a desperate politician, and, and many grounds had been cited. One of the cardinal uh, criticisms of free SHS, one was the fact that it's a wholesale approach no needs assessment was conducted, and that if the son of Samson could afford research, for instance, why pay for him? And then he goes to school, and there are times he, he, he doesn't have full meals. That was one of the cardinal um, criticisms. Now, you, you just oppose that to the uh, proposed uh, policy position on this, um, the proposed level 100 support, and you ask them, are you targeting? So no, it covers all. Even that all is questionable. So there is no element of needs assessment whatsoever to ascertain those who can afford. And to in that principle or that policy position they use to criticize free SHS, to be able to identify the real people who may be in need. When you interrogate the 43,000 further, if it's ascertained that there's 10,000 who, who drop out, truncate the education because, of course, you have failed to identify those. And your, your, your policy is not going to target them but it's going to be a blanket one, which flaws your position. Again, um, public universities is just a component of the many institutions at the tertiary where thousands of students uh, enroll. That their policy is only targeting public universities. When they were even asked about technical universities after their press conference, they were unsure. There were many divergent views that were expressed by the NDC on many, uh, many media channels. And so technical universities definitely were excluded from this policy. Uh, colleges of education were excluded. Nursing and midwifery training colleges and colleges of our great and other uh, tertiary institutions have, were, have been excluded in this particular um, um, policy. And so it is not a policy that is well thought through. It is not a, a comprehensive one that is to bring any solution. Um, the other question so, that... So, uh, get, get streamline to... something for me in your argument. It's a good policy, but not properly thought through. Is that what you're saying? It is not as far-fetched. It is a far-fetched policy. Okay, so, policy so, so, so help me here. It's a policy that does not... It's a policy that does not... I, I'm, and, and, and you would, you would realize, yeah. you realize I'm giving you some guidance. You need to take care of you. The same way the NDC went about opposing free SHS. And now you hunt them every minute. You suggest that they cannot even take over and manage it because they were against it. You also may have to be careful what you say. 
Is it a no good sanction. policy? But it no needs sanction. it needs to be varied in a certain way. Is, is it a policy you think a policy proposition you think should not be thought a, a, about at all, or what? What are you saying? My my position to your question is that if there is any candidate who wants to be elected uh, to become president, who wants to make a bold declaration to say, just as President Okufuado and Dr. Mahmoud Baumia made a bold declaration, a commitment to the subsequently uh, this chart to make SHS free for all, and for that reason, and for that legacy attached to their name, they would also want to make tertiary free. And by so doing, from level 100 all the way to level 400 or 500 and 600, in some cases, will be free with all categories of tertiary students included. I would call that policy a good one. Now, just coming so, to... So, so uh, are, you, are you giving us a hint into what is going to be launched tomorrow, that you will rather take it further by proposing free tertiary education? That is not the argument I'm making. The argument I'm making is that the intent of lessening the burden of a Ghanaian student and removing barriers to access to tertiary education have been sustainably put in place and is under implementation. For tertiary now, education, the Constitution says progressively free. When, yes, when should that start? I would, I, would very much, I would very much appreciate if you would give me time to make my points and then maybe when you have specific uh, interrogations to some aspects, uh, we, we do so. Please but go I've on. Been speaking for five minutes and, and, and I'm having all these interrogations. All right. So the, the point that I'm making is that, one, mm. level 100 mm. support, as proposed by um, the NDC, only six to target public universities, the exclusion of technical universities, colleges of education, not, uh, not less than midway free training colleges. That is one policy incoherence. The second thing is that people ask them, granted that you are able to pay for the level 100 admission fees and the student gets enrolled, how do they sustain their stay throughout the period? Because something staying in is as critical as getting in. There is no point going in, in for admission. Uh, a student from my village getting admission fees paid, going to university to spend a year, after which there's no means of furthering the education and returning to their village. You haven't helped that person. You have only helped the person for level 100 he has entered, but the fundamental challenges that he had for which he could not afford entry into the university has not changed. His circumstances may not have changed. And so even if you put in 300, uh, if you put in 100,000 students in by paying the admission fees, there is no guarantee that they would survive beyond level 100 after the expiry of that support you have given. And then secondly, the response they give as to how to sustain the level 200, 300, 400, and 500, 600 in some instances is that they would fall on student loan trust fund. Now, Samsung Student Loan Trust Fund had, had been restricted in its attractiveness because of the guarantee requirement for a long period. Now, we came to power, we conducted research on all our tertiary campuses, and six in 10 students, tertiary students, private students, and um, public university students, all indicated their willingness to seek support from Student Loan Trust Fund to support the education if the guarantee requirements were removed. And upon that, we took steps. Cabinet approved this policy position by His Excellency the President and the Vice President. Subsequently, Ministry of Education referred them to Parliament. And that amendment was, was carried out in the Student Loan Trust Fund Act. So for the past two and a half years, we have had a, an expanded policy that now has removed the, the, the bottlenecks. People who did not have um, relatives who could put their pensions on the line now have the Ghana card just to present to the Student Loan Trust Fund to access the share education. Since that introduction, we have seen access increase. We have seen, uh, we have seen uh, the, the, the plight of the Ghanaian tertiary student reduced. 
that's, that does not only um, that is not only open to public university students, both public and private, and all tertiary students for that matter. So having taken that bold step to remove that barrier and to ensure that you set conditions that will support hundreds of thousands of students without any barrier, right from level 100 all the way to the, their prescribed period of completion, is a massive barrier that is removed. And so the, the, the position of someone that is only looking at tackling just level 100, opposed to one that has removed barriers for all levels, including private, which Re of these two... Re Reverend Tim Fodjo, Fodjo, do you find that the argument you just make, the last point, may actually properly assist the point they are making? You have removed this barrier, and yet people still have a difficulty at the entrance level where they are offered admission conditioned on a certain fee payment, which when they default, they don't get into the university. So they say, let's clear that hurdle for them to enter. So they are able to now access the student loan that you have made easy to acquire for the year two, year three, and year four. So don't you see some difficulty in the argument there? There are those who are asking you the question as the NPP, that good policy, free SHS, blanket for everyone. So is it your plan that the person gets a BEC certificate, uh, as a, as a SSE certificate, and their education ends there? That is a poor person you want to help. You have helped them to get SSS education. How do they progress from there? The NDC says, let's give them the opportunity to progress from there at least for the first year, during which they can settle down. And if there are issues with the loan scheme, they will, they will be able to fix all of these by the end of the first year. You say that's the wrong policy? But if, that, that's a, if that's a position that one may take, then fundamentally it comes down to the question that people that are entering into university are obviously people who have completed SHS. And so a policy position that asserts people to complete PIVOTs and SHS, and for which now would, would want to enter tertiary, and, 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 and a party who consistently have made their position known until a few months ago in, 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 against free SHS. Obviously, you would not graduate to tertiary from BEC. You would need an SHS qualification to enter into tertiary. And the even fundamental analysis of their research, I've followed it now. 43,000 is not the, the actual number of people who empirically are not able to access education or tertiary education because funding is a problem, particularly at the entry level. That is fundamentally flawed. When you say when you, so, say you have flawed that uh, analysis, are you, are you by extension saying all the 43,000 for the 2020-2021 academic year who could not uh, honor their admissions, they went into private universities? Many may have gone to nursing and midwifery training colleges. Others may have gone to colleges of education. And you would find a lesser number. I am not in any way making it a point that no student in Ghana faces entry, tertiary entry um, challenges due to finances or due to certain systemic challenges. That is not a point I'm making. But I'm saying that the basis of their projection of 43,000 as the people who miss out the opportunity to go to tertiary institutions on, on, on the grounds of um, um, lack of financial without is flawed. Do you, sincerely, do you sincerely think, and perhaps you and I, our time when we're applying for universities, we did the same thing. I applied to about three universities. Um, I made provision to take care if anything happens. I applied to um, uh, teacher training. But do you sincerely believe that if I can enter the university, I will go to the other options you are referring to? Yes. There's a logic in that. Had, I have had many. It's not a matter of logic, but it's a matter of practice and what people encounter, matter of choice. 
people prefer nursing and midwifery training colleges. And there are many occasions, as a member of parliament, I've encountered many constituents and other people who are even beyond the shoulder of my So why, why do they apply to the university who, if they, who, all they wanted who, to do is the other place? Who have had, at the application level, many options, but in the selection, opt for either College of Education or nursing, tra nursing and midwifery training colleges. Okay. Now, Colleges of Education offer a Bachelor of Education. So, for instance, if one applied to pursue College of Education for a BA in basic education, and at the same time applied to University of Education, Winneba or UCC, for a BA in, in social studies work, and, and, and admissions come and they feel that by proximity, post uh, for Sioux College of Education or Akati College of Education, for that matter, is what will suit their choice on the pursuit of the same program. They would make that choice. Okay. So these are the th these are some of the instances. Thank you. But hold again, on, hold on there for me. Let me come to Nanaya Jantua. Uh, Dr. Tia Champong, hold on for me. I'll come to you, Dr. Tia Champong. You have allowed me to make uh, my point. You have made. You have spoken more than uh, Okujeto spoke. If you are going to use time, I'll calculate it for you. And let me be frank with you. That thing doesn't help. Where we are having a discussion, I'm asking questions, and you guys try to poison the the mind of people that. You are being unnecessarily heckled. You are not being given sufficient time. It is not fair at all. So far, you have spoken far more than Lokujeto did. All right, just hold it there for me. Nanaya, um, from where you sit, uh, let's, let's take it that you will not be dealing with the cold facts that uh, the minister has access to, Okujeto have access to, and have a way uh, of looking at them that you will not have that opportunity. So tell us, what do you make of this policy? Samson, good morning and thank you very much. Um, good morning to your viewers. Good morning to my brother. Um, honorable morning. and honorable. <laughs> you see, Samson, I, I get a bit perturbed when issues concerning education are mixed in a rumble, a fumble, and politics. Because the policies concerning education in this country, whichever way you look at it, are good. But the issue comes when the implementation becomes a problem. For me, where I sit and from who I am, I would never go against any policy that seeks to help students go to school. Because Society for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, as you know, started the free education in the North, progressively to come to the other parts of the country, and he was um, taking off power. Free SHS is a good policy. And I do not think that any government has said free SHS is not a good policy. It is the plan, the implementation. Some say that we are doing it progressively. Others are saying that we are doing it at once. Even that, when we come to the MPP, they did it progressively. They started from the first years, then went to the, the second year. So whilst those who were in first year were enjoying free, the second years were paying, then the third years were paying, then it went on and on till it ended with the third years, and now they are paying for everybody. This youth manifesto is a good initiative because it gives the youth a certain kind of um, acceptance and importance. So for this initiative, I believe that it is good. And also when I was reading it, there is no specificity to it. They said to scrap academic fees for level 100 students through the no stress, no fee stress initiative. Level 100, as we stand today, nursing colleges, there's a level 100. Communication university, there's a level 100. Private university, there's a level 100. So then it takes the NDC to come and tell us what is their scope. Are they targeting? He'll be answering that question because a lot of people are asking it. Do you get me? Are they targeting and maybe progressively extend it to other universities? If you say level 100, there are also private level 100 students who also need... They say public. They didn't say private. Uh, but private to school... No, for now, that's the policy uh, but, opposition. But, my dear, but <laughs> I don't see it here. They said to scrap academic fees. Maybe there's an addendum I haven't read. To scrap academic... You're a lawyer to scrap academic fees for level 100 students through the no fee stress initiative. In public tertiary yes, institutions. I didn't see public. Yes, there. the full document. Okay. That's what is there. Okay. 
But why then do you discriminate? Because the, the, the people in the private schools are also part of the young people, the youth in this country. So why discriminate? Because those in private senior high school have been talking about it. I mean, governance and economic development are building blocks. And I believe that as governments come in and governments go, everybody will pick a part of the block to, to build on. If Ham and Chroma did it in the north, Namadu is doing free SHS. Um, when the, our constitution says that the basic level is free, His Excellency John Draman Yohama says, when I come, I am going to do the tertiary one. I do not think that we have to politicize it. We need to find out how are you going to do it. A cash recalculation that I did, if we are doing all the 118,000, we are paying 257, 259. I make it 260 rounded up. Million Ghana cities for the year. If you are doing the full 118. If you are doing the 74, you are doing 163 million. So where are we going to get the money from? The money that we are talking about concerning um, cutting government expenditure, how much, what work has been done to know how much has been accrued? That if I cut off Ministry 1, Ministry 2, Ministry 3, government machinery, um, also Office of the President, how do you cut? So you need to do all that and know they, how... He explained that for Get Fund mm -hmm. and... Um, what's his name, Kofi Asari of Kofi Education Asari. Watch, Watch. Mm -hmm. that by this calculation, you need only 4% of GET fund. To do if that. you are uncapping GET fund, you need only 4% of the funds there to pay for all of it. But GET fund has been capped for a reason. Mm -hmm. do you get That's right. So if you uncap it, I mean, for my layman's mind, you said I'm not any one of them. So mm -hmm. if you uncap it, Whatever you capped it for, what will happen? You capped it for a certain intervention. Priorities. So what would then happen? My priority is fund this or pan, place. Or fund this so place. what you were using the capping to fund is not my priority So, anymore. But what, what were they using the capping to fund? <laughs> I can give you a list of many things that we can cut. Uh -huh. National Cathedral. Oh. That's what they were using the money for. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> $58.1 million. Oh, sorry. It was from the, it was from, it was from the national coffers. Yes, but consolidated that, that fund. Yes, that okay. one. The capping of mm. get fund. Okay, you can't the, identify. It went into the consolidated. You can't. You can't identify that this get fund amount mm -hmm. went here, but it is because it goes into it's the all into the consolidated the, the larger fund. pool. Yes, and okay. those are some of the things they were using it for. I bet. Thirty-four point nine million. Bet, that bet, is, bet, is that a fair? <laughs> that, that is, that, that, <laughs> is that a fair that thing to do? That is a sum cost. That means three hundred and is it three hundred? Yeah, thirty-nine million. Thirty-nine million has gone down the drain. I mean, and nobody. Uh, and you can't get that money back uh, somewhat unless maybe you go through a certain process. So don't lose your, don't lose your thoughts. <laughs> you see, he just got keep, it. Keeps your focus. <laughs> <laughs> so I was asking the question that the money, if it is uncapped, whatever it was being used for in the consolidated fund, what is going to happen to those interventions? I do not think that the interventions were all, I mean, non-productive. It is possible that maybe... About 40% was non-productive, but let's say 60% was productive. So how then do you um, fund those ones? I mean, it's a question that we have to ask. His Excellency was also talking about Ministry of Youth. He said he was going to reduce the number, number of ministries. The to 60? Yes, the Constitution allows... Premier is talking 50, right? Yes, he's talking... Okay. He said ministers. Yeah. It means including deputy ministers. The Constitution allows cabinet ministers at the level of 19. So any other, I mean, excesses are deputy ministers or ministries that are really not important. So the 19, yes. But if you are going to cap, then you have Ministry of Youth. Why don't you add youth to gender? So the Ministry of, Ministry of Youth and Gender. Okay. You get it. So that you reduce your cost. Because now we are reducing cost margins to ensure that we do the right thing. They are telling you that priority, mm -hmm. this is what we want to do. Yeah. Priority. Yes, yeah, but priority, but there's also gender to its priority. Women and gender and youth. We look after the young ones. 
So they would be in a better position to be with us. They haven't said they will scrap gender. They won't scrap it, but they should add the youth to it so that, I mean, it becomes, you save money. There, there will be one minister in charge of youth. So you are giving an advice. Yes, I'm giving okay. an advice that they should do that so that, mm. because we have spent so much money in this country mm. on some of these things, which are, look at the ministries, aviation, transport. It, it's a waste of money. Mm. It, I mean, it's truly a waste of money. And... I believe that we need to save some money. When, when the, I don't know if I can go there, but when the deputy minister was talking, I got the impression from where I sit that he believes in the, the, the concept, the initiative, but because of politics, he's going around it to, make, to ensure that it is not accepted. So he was just struggling around it. But everybody who, I mean, loves this country should be able to, accept such policies. Sometimes you were saying something I was laughing in my head. You said that oh, you can pay your child's school fees. So, I mean, the user fee, admission fee. Many times over. Uh -huh. But you see, you, you drive on bad roads. Hmm. Your electricity is not of good quality. You don't have water. Hmm? I mean, so many things are not right. You pay taxes. So if your child is also enjoying a little bit of the taxes that you pay, that you paid all along, that you don't see the effect of it. So if your child is also enjoying some 2,200 as um, fees, I, I think it, it, is, it, it is acceptable. But we all know how these free things have affected and impacted quality. No, but it's, it, it's but a discussion we're having ah, That's what I'm saying. So when they put it down like that, we need to see the plan. Because for me, you don't, you don't just come and tell me that you are going to pay free fees mm. for, I mean, first-year students. How are you going to do it? You are going to scrub um, the free SHS, the, what do they call it? There's a name for it. My son is going to free SHS. So. Double track. The double track. track. Right. So how are you going to deal with it? Because now everybody is going, so everybody is going to SHS. So how are you going to deal with it? You are going to build more schools in the first year. We know what infrastructure is like. Okay, maybe then you say that you are going to then, I mean, go back to the e-blocks and all that. So we need a plan because the MPP did not come up with a plan with the, on the free SHS. Even though it's a good project, it has been performed. It has performed abysmally. It has been implemented anyhow without any seriousness around it because they didn't come with the source documents. It is after the World Bank and other people started talking that they decided that they should have an ally. But an ally to what? Because there was no document surrounding that concept. And there's a need that if a government wants to come into power, we need to ask them to give us whatever they want to do. They should tell us. You say it, but put a, a timeline to it. Put a plan. You don't need law to implement a policy. No, I'm saying... If they are implementing a policy without law, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm talking about a source document. That's the policy. Yes, to tell me that, oh, I'm, I'm doing there's this no ABC. Yes, yeah, there's no the policy. There should be a source document. No Even in my life, I have a source document for my life. Oh. You have one, a plan. Re 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 Rev said this thing is far-fetched. But what you guys are saying to me now sounds far-fetched. Why is it far-fetched? <laughs> if I, if I want that there's no policy in the implementation of no, free no, you, you say, Have you ever seen You said you don't need the law, but what is a source document? We've been asking him. Yes, everybody's asking. Where is the source document? Uh, hold on. Uh, do, uh, uh, Rev, you are here. Is this true that, that there's no policy documents for free SHS? Yes. Um, Samson, there is a policy document for free SHS. So if Nanaya um, is interested in that, we would make a copy available. Okay, well, thank you. We're further taking that into a bill, which will soon be presented to, uh, to Parliament. And we have had occasion where His Excellency, the former President Mahama, had even um, declared publicly that he would support that free SHS bill whenever it is. Yeah, we know, we know about the bill. I, I, just so needed, we, I just needed a yes or no to the issue of policy. Where do we find the policy? The policy is available. So anytime she wants to wants to have access to that, we would make it available. Okay. 
so hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, please. No, 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 there's no room for argument, gentlemen. Gentlemen, there's no room for argument yet. Um, because of the two of you, because of the two of you, I have actually overdone my time for this subject. Hold on, Dr. Thea Champon, please come in. Um, Dr. Okay, um, Reverend Tim Fodjo says this is far fetched. Uh, far fetched, according to the Oxford uh, Dictionary, is improbable, unlikely, implausible, scarcely credible, difficult to believe. I don't know which one of them he wants me to choose because I'd ask him to say it categorically if he meant that <laughs> this one, this thing was wrong and it should not be done. Yes, Dr. Thierry Champo. Yes, uh, good morning uh, to, to you and everyone. I, I've been following the, the, the debates and the conversations quite uh, keenly. And I think first of maybe let's start, for me, the idea of, uh, of a youth manifesto and specifically addressing issues related to youth is good, is welcome. Uh, I, I applaud the, the NDC on that side, particularly when you look at the you know, population and housing census, the 2021 data, that actually shows that eight in ten of our population, or eighty percent, is actually below the age of um, forty years, more or less, right? Um, so you you've got major issues to address and major issues to tackle. And I think all the political parties uh, would have either a manifesto within the main manifesto or separate documents that would uh, address or deal with issues of of the youth and unemployment and all of that. So that's commendable, but specifically on this issue of uh, you know scrapping academic fees for uh, level 100 students um, and and related um, matters, I go back to what I have said on this platform and others you know uh, severally, what I call the politics of principles, right? If you recall, you actually asked the Honourable Okujeto a question and you said, well. It's a whole wholesale approach. And the conversation, if you use free SHS as the uh, argument back then, and some of us actually wrote, there are papers that were written on this, that you actually have to find a means, you know, to, to target and find a means to get those who genuinely, for one reason or the other, cannot access these uh, educational facilities to be able to allow them to get access to, to, to it. And it's actually quite interesting that fast forward down the line, you have, you know, a semblance of that policy, I mean, the free SHS, showing its way in this new policy proposal by uh, the, the, the NDC, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it goes back to the issue of the, you know, the politics of convenience that, that, I, that I talked about. And it's important because something, your producer showed a number of chats on the screen. I think the first one or the second one, where you had about 113,000 or so uh, getting uh, the enrollment and eventually was about 70,000, but you've got a, a gap of 43,000 that for one reason or the other are not able to access rights uh, you know, the, the admish, admission, and this is presumably only university admission. So this these numbers here may even be much bigger if you add the um, uh, the nursing colleges, teacher training, and all the other categorizations of um, uh, um, uh, university or tertiary, you know, education. So the point is, if you've got 118,000 and about 75,000 are getting in, why don't you deal with the problem of the 43,000 and rather seek to, again, use this blanket wholesale approach of getting the 118,000 right uh, in there? Because after all, we know that money and resources are fungible and you could actually use some of the monies that you're, you're saving. So for example, if you do the 118,000 as you have on your screen, Three, you will spend more money from a state side. If you do only the 43,000, which in this case you are targeting and you have means to uh, you know, uh, um, address that, you spend a little bit less money than you would have done on the 118,000. In other words, you have 
money to save to do other things. And in my view, having sort of followed the discussion in the education sector and particularly with tertiary um, uh, education, you see that the biggest problem we have in our education sector in Ghana across the board is actually with primary education. You can go and look at the data on education outcomes and net enrollment and things like that. So we should be targeting and channeling more resources towards addressing the issues within the primary education sector and um, relatively less, in my view, on um, you know, uh, university uh, and other tertiary education. Because if the foundation is weak, it doesn't matter what you do, the, the, the building would crumble sometime you know, uh, down the line. And you can actually, uh, there's a quote, there's a, um, a, a Ghanaian Times news article uh, from uh, 16th of August, 2024. Um, and this actually quotes two education experts, one of whom you mentioned, Mr. Kofi Asari and then Dr. Uh, Peter Anti. Um, and I would like to read that to put this into context. It says that, quote, two education experts have recommended that the National Democratic Congress focus its proposed free academic user policy specifically on first year students in public universities who, and I like to stress here, are genuinely unable to pay the fees rather than applying it to all students. And you can go on and you can go uh, uh, you know, further. So even the experts within the sector and those who follow these issues much more closely are proposing some form of targeting and some form of means testing. We can have a, a debate as to how do you do that. But I think the principled policy position, especially in the context where you have scarce financial resources, you are in an IMF program, um, and the fiscal space is just not there. Even if you uncap get fund, I would argue that uncapping get fund the extra monies that are there should be channeled to primary education because that is where the biggest weakness in our education sector is. So, you know, the, the, the proposal is welcome. It should be fine-tuned. Like I argued with free SHS, there has to be a way or means for people that genuinely cannot afford to be able to, to access. Um, and we do not live in a world that you know we have unlimited resources. I have said again that sometimes we behave like we are Arabian kings, right? As though we have all the money in the world to do everything. But the reality is that we do not have. And so you've got to prioritize even within the education sector and spend the monies where you know they are they are most needed. And we need principled politics in, in my view really to move this country, you know, forward. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thio Champong. And uh, we'll have to end this here. But obviously, because of the little, you know, issues that came up that need to be firmed up, we'll do that in the next five minutes between the two um, former minister and current deputy minister. Um, <coughs> is, this, is this policy proposition targeting or or some of the tertiary institutions? Yes, yeah, so if you look at page six of the youth manifesto we put out, we were very clear that implement a no fees stress program to alleviate the financial burden on parents and students in financing tertiary education. Mm, tertiary. Right. tertiary education. Yes. So I don't know where Reverend Tim Fogio yeah, is coming from with this university thing. Yes. Then on the data, and, we and that, that confirms, yes. I actually yes. double checked, yes. it confirms what you said, yes. that they didn't say the pub uh, no. public. No. They said tertiary, uh, tertiary, tertiary education. at the university for a level 100 Andres students. students. It yes. didn't say public, public. university. No. no, they said they tertiary. Say, yes, so it's tertiary. Te tertiary. It covers everybody. Yes. All the forms of tertiary education, mm. including public, private. Then the data we've put out, the source is there. Then you must get your communicators to do a good job because some are saying something else. Oh, really? Mm. Yes. Well, and I'm, it's got I'm, people I'm, to be asking the question mm. that some says it's limited to this, it's limited no, 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 to that. You should read page yeah. six of the document. Is there? Okay, the, the, mm. Then we'll, we'll check that. Mm. Then the source of the data is GTEC. 
the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. So if Reverend in team is saying today that oh, he has flawed the data, he's flawed his own data, agency under, under his, his ministry. No, it's and the then, interpretation of then, that data. And then he doesn't give us, in his so-called interpretation, he doesn't give us any figures and any sources. So, please. He's he, making he, logical he, deductions. Is it, he not allowed to no, do that? It, it, it's on a flawed premise. So everything you do will be flawed. You know, we're talking about tertiary education. Okay. And then he is trying to do his own, you know, uh, uh, right. demarcations and confiscations. Then he talks about they have provided access because they took away guarantees. The political party that has provided the biggest access because of the investments that we built, we don't deserve credit. The University for Development Studies, the University for Health and Allied Sciences, University of Energy and Natural Resources, the University of Environment and Social Development. And I personally worked on this supporting Professor Nana Jinopuku Ajima. We don't deserve credit. Converting the polytechnics to technical universities. We establish all of this. Expanding University of Education Winneba, giving okay. them a charter. Let's set up so, new arguments. So, uh, let's so, not set up new so, arguments. So, so if it's about <laughs> access to tertiary mm. education, if it's mm. about the political tradition mm, that believes in tertiary education, that knows how to expand access to make sure that every region has a public university, our record is on par. Of course, you introduced, you introduced the guest fund. Exactly. Uh, with all the opposition that came with it. Um, so, uh, Reverend Tim Fodjo, what will be the issues you need to uh, tidy up in the next two minutes so we can move on to our next subject? Yeah, thanks, Samson. Uh, maybe Honorable Ablaka says that they have increased access to tertiary education. Data defeats that submission. In 2015, uh, gross tertiary enrollment ratio in this country was 15%. As we speak, gross tertiary enrollment ratio is 23%. So we have 23% from an, an improvement from 16% to 23%. So that is a data that shows you the, who the has question is increased where, access. Where are the students going to? Education. Which institutions Again, are now they on, attending? On, the, on the, pub, the issue of whether their policy seeks to target public universities or all tertiary institutions, I have listened and argue, uh, had a, a media a, a, a debate with the deputy ranking of the Education Committee, Dr. Park, I've listened to the National Youth Organizer. I've listened to um, other stalwarts who have all asserted and clearly that it's only for public investors. And when questions were put to them, so they need to address their own interpretations. Now, the second thing is, if you the funding estimates also whenever they are asked, they have divergent submissions. Here, my good brother has submitted an estimate between 250 to 260. Well, that is different, but close to what the President Mahama said, 270 to 200 and 230 to 270 million. But we also have a divergent submission of 600 million cities. All these they need to address for the Ghanaian people to know exactly what they're talking about. But the question fundamentally is, why exclude private schools at tertiary if you have any such credible support? If you seek to expand free SHS to include all private schools? So these policy incoherences and, and policy principles contradictions are the reasons why I say that their proposal is far-fetched. So uh, mm -hmm. it's not a matter of addressing whether good or bad, right. but uh, I'm saying that, and, 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 and here again, and, uh, here again, now if you've consistently opposed free SHS, and just in recent times, in the past three months, um, suddenly taking a U-turn to support free SHS, and now further targeting something that you are even going to do a wholesale without even doing a targeting, which is contradicting to your own major criticism of the free SHS, does leave Ghanaians to conclude All right. that it's just another time of politics. But the credibility and the track record of the people promising is something to be taken into consideration. Thank you very much. And you would have thought that the NDC would have learned its lessons from how Nana Akufuado started the free SHS debate as to funding so that all things would have been clear, so that they are not speaking from different angles about certain aspects of it, including the funding. Uh, this is where we terminate this uh, topic. We will take a quick break, return to 
ask about lands that allegedly are being grabbed by politically exposed persons. And irrespective of the rebuttal or the reaction by the lands minister, with some evidence, Okujeto Ablakwa continues and insists that he has superior evidence to show that um, things are really bad. Thanks to Reverend John Intim Fojo, Deputy Education Minister. Uh, Dr. Theo Champong will continue with us. Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa is also going to continue to be here. And Nanaya Jantua will also be here. We'll be joined by um, Cletus Alenga, Alenga, who is Legal Counsel, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. We'll be right back. You're welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. Just a couple of the messages on our first uh, topic. Um, Dr. Justice Shram Sai says that um, I nearly agreed with Dr. Champong that targeting is a good way to implement social intervention programs. However, that is only in theory. In practice, in this country, targeting always ends up targeting only the rich, uh, the connected and the capable, rather than the poor, vulnerable and incapable. Check all the scholarship schemes we have had. And you will agree with me, we have seen rich ministers and their children getting scholarships, while truly brilliant, needy, and unconnected children don't. How do we deal with that in the short term? Blanket implementation comes in strongly. Uh, that's an issue many are raising. I was actually going to raise it with uh, Reverend Tim Fodjo, uh, but at a time when he felt I was, you know, interfering, I stopped and forgot to ask it. So thanks for that. Then, um, this one says, as Dean of Student Affairs at Takradi Technical University, I'm deeply aware of the financial struggles students face in paying tuition and accommodation fees. However, considering Ghana's current economic situation, including the free senior high uh, school education program, the aftermath of COVID-19 and our IMF program, it will be irresponsible for politicians to promise free tuition for all first year university students. Instead, such promises should be targeted towards brilliant but needy students and those with special needs. What is, so people with special needs are actually getting completely free, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, what is the stance of the uh, Vice Chancellor's Ghana and uh, VCTU Ghana on this policy? Were they consulted? Okay. So this is coming from Professor Eric Bruce Amate Jr., Dean of Student Affairs, Takradi Technical University. A uh, couple of more. Uh, in, in, in Teka Dre says, I would need to see a whole plan on how they plan to sustain it when it starts. It is a laudable idea, but I am sick of our politicians just introducing grandiose plans without thinking about its sustainability. News file. You know, I was asking a Reverend Tim Fodjo, don't be surprised if Bahamia launches his <laughs> manifesto and he promises that it's not just for first years, <laughs> but it's going to be for <laughs> the whole. Because this is what they do. They, they get to compete, you know, for these things to get their votes. Anyway, uh, Lorinto Kone, no fees for level 100, no stress at level 100. Stress in Kwa from level 200 to 400. Who wants this? Okay, you don't want half a loaf. You want all of it. The student's loan will take care of you. Okay, live. I believe these freebies aren't the solution. The benefits of free tuition realized through future employment and taxation will take years to materialize. Instead, <clears throat> our focus should be on agriculture to create real jobs and address rising food prices, especially with farmers warning of worsening conditions yeah, in the north. If the NDC prioritizes agriculture and invest wisely, we can boost local food production, reduce inflation, and lessen our dependence on foreign goods. 
that's another subject. Benedict 15, you say that the intention to customize in strategic thinking forces, customize in strategic thinking forces a person to go beyond vague ideas and engage in specific ways to go after a task or problem before it can be solved. A problem must be clearly defined. Musa Abatoa, NDC is a party rooted in social equality. It has introduced practical policy focusing on youth. The initiative to absorb first year tertiary students fee will increase enrollment, enabling students to access higher education without financial barriers. And finally, um, Small Love says, as a young, as a young man, my problem with every policy is one, intentions, two, source of funding, which is very key. Three, how long can they keep the policy running? And I think we should hold on to the free things. For now, uh, we are struggling with fiscal space and revenue <clears throat> challenges. All right, thank you very much. Um, now on the matter of state capture manifested in land grabbing by politically exposed persons, particularly in this regime, a campaign started by Samuel Okujetua Blackwa and has led to a number of uh, policies, we are being told. Um, and he's also promoting a bill to stop politically exposed persons from acquiring public lands. Let's listen to a brief um, interaction that occurred in respect of the subject and come to the studio. Today, unlike most of our compatriots on the continent, Lands in our country are largely owned by these two kings, clans, and families. Over the years, however, governments have acquired some of these lands either by purchase, lease, gift, compulsory acquisition, vesting, or through some other modes. These are the lands referred to as the public lands of Ghana, which government has direct control over. Just as governments have been acquiring lands since the inception of our republic, every government, without exception, has granted some of these public lands to private entities for various developmental purposes. Unfortunately, some people have packaged some of these lands which were granted to private developers decades ago and presented them as evidence of what they have termed, quote, state capture. End quote. The ministry has had to issue press statements to correct some of these misinformations. We set up a team. We went into negotiations with Achimota Forest because we were concerned about the ecological integrity of the forest and we wanted a buffer. We wanted a buffer between what the Achimota for the old family will have and what will now constitute today's Achimota Forest. And we were able to negotiate a reduction of 100 acres out of the 362 acres which had been cast in iron by previous governments and, and, and the current administration had been bound legally by previous governments for the release of 362 acres of the Achimota Forest. Right. <clears throat> so, let's begin with Samuel Okujetua Blackwa who has been on this crusade. And uh, on his, in front of him on the desk, he's actually occupied the front of uh, Nanaya as well. <laughs> ah. No, you are welcome. Uh, it's a flood that is coming, <laughs> not from the Akoso Boda. It's coming my way. And I want my producers to, to zoom the camera to it. I want to show you something. Beside him, there are two boxes, two boxes, <laughs> boxes of uh, documents. <laughs> so, in this one hour, I don't know how I'm going to be able to restrain him, but I'll try. Mm -hmm. So, you had to hold a press conference after Abu Jinapur spoke. 
Abu Jinapo has been consistent in sharing the evidence that point to the contrary on at least three of the major issues you raise about land grab. The filling station in Wa, the, the Bulgarian embassy, and then the Parks and, Gardens. Parks and Gardens. And you may add the judges' bungalows as well. Yes, from the evidence he's continued to churn out to us, it doesn't appear there's any wrongdoing in here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me, uh, first of all, state that I come to this discussion and these matters with utmost good faith, with patriotic intentions, having the country at heart, and also thinking about our very existence. Because some of these lands we are talking about, parks and gardens lands, forests, Ramsey sites, and all of that, if the destruction continues, the wanton dissipation continues, we face an existential threat. We will just be on a suicidal mission. And that will be the end of us. Now, we are talking about public lands which belong to all of us, it is important that that premise is understood. And the Article 2571 of the Constitution of Ghana, it provides, all public lands in Ghana shall be vested in the president on behalf of and in trust for the people of Ghana. So these are our lands we are talking about. And so, all of us must be interested in this discussion as citizens. Now, the Malice, which has been properly captured as state capture, the nomenclature state capture, let nobody pretend that I am crying wolf when there is no basis. We have only recently come out of a national campaign to protect our state hotels. The SNIT hotels will have been captured by an individual, their great minister. But for my vigilance, conducting my parliamentary oversight, and rallying the country to protect those hotels. We have seen people die, public officials die. Mm. And in their will, we have seen forests. We have seen Ramsar mm. sites. We have seen the institution of architects issue statements that suddenly they are not getting contrast any longer. And it's all the architectural contrast is going to one person, David Ajay and Associates. I have the statement they issued here. Architects chide government over starving them. Gives over 12 contrasts to Sir David Ajay. So state capture manifests under various forms, under various guises, where a few people, what belongs to all of us, they arrogate it to themselves. Mm. So this is an important national discussion, which we must really half because it is about our country don't forget something that the president himself not too long ago told this country that he missed out twice on the deadline for his agenda 111 during covid mm. he promised this country that within a year radical hospital expansion program after missing his deadlines on two occasions he came back to tell us that the main reason was because they couldn't find land. land. If our public lands were not being sold like confetti, the president himself would not have missed his deadlines and will, he would not still, as we speak, be struggling with land for Agenda 111. And I have consistently asked that why is it that our forebears procured land, acquired land, preserved them, had land banks for development, for factories? <laughs> Nobody builds factories in the skies. Nobody will carry out massive industrialization, hospitals, schools, and all of that, if you don't have land. So this is a very, very important discussion. And the attempt to engage in cheap political point scoring and wanting to equalize really acts me. And that's what the lands minister has been doing. Now, let, let me drill down to the evidence. I'll begin with the Bulgarian embassy demolition. Right. Be because we have gone over this before. Yes. 
I'd like you to go to the jugular about them. Yes. You insist that where we have gotten to, it's becoming a government liability. Yes. He insists that this was a private individual's you know, business, but because it involved an embassy, they had to come in. Where is he wrong? He is totally wrong because the dishonesty. You see, I now understand why the minister did everything to prevent us from getting the sole inquiry's report, Justice Ofriate's report. I filed an ITI request. My lawyers wrote to him. He refused to submit that report. And I keep saying that, look, public officials, we spend taxpayer funds to set up these commissions of inquiry. Those reports must be made public. Something, it had to take my ingenuity to intercept the 160-page report, a copy of which I have here. When you read this report, the findings and the recommendations do not support what the Lance Minister is saying, that purely a private affair. It's not true. Indeed, this report, the Lance Commission has been indicted. If you look at page 122, it has been observed that if the officers who worked on the judgment for cancellation had been diligent in executing their mandate, they would have noticed that the order for cancellation was against Mr. Anson's interests and not the Bulgarian's interests, which is the deed of sublease. It's stated here. Another paragraph, Bulgaria's land title certificate number GAC 454 was eventually cancelled. We find that this was fraudulently done. The sole inquirer indicts the Lands Commission when you read this report. And the sole inquirer also says at page 123 that Mr. Joe Joe Hagan, without the necessary notices to the occupiers, forcibly evicted them, that's the Bulgarians, and caused the demolition of the property without following due process. The demolition was done on 30th March 2017. When the minister says that these are decade-old matters that we are rehashing, it's not true. The appeals court at the time had held that the Bulgarian embassy's premises <coughs> under the Vienna Convention, is an, the, the principle of inviolability, should be respected. They defied all of that when you read this report. Then paragraph 6.1. It doesn't change the facts. No, 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 please, I'm coming there. Okay. I'm coming there. Mm. Paragraph 6.16. The minister wants to create the impression that, oh, politicians are not involved. And that this was, uh, you know, don't bring in state capture. They don't bring people associated to the president here. Read paragraph 6.16. It says, after the demolition, Mr. Joe Joe Hagan went ahead and assigned the land for the unexpired residue of Leighton's lease to Dr. Yao Eduampuma on 11 December 2018. Dr. Yaeduan Puma went into possession and prepared the land for development. It was in the course of the development that his workers were asked to stop work and subsequently arrested by the property fraud unit. The question, therefore, is who is Dr. Yaeduan Puma? The one who stood to benefit, who was at the center of this whole thing. He isn't, is he not the president's appointee at the National Development Planning Commission? He is. A politically exposed person. And he's acquiring a property from an individual. Who has engaged. An cons individual. Conspired <coughs> with <coughs> officials at the last commission. The Justice of Riata has discovered that they engage in fraudulent conduct. They were not diligent. How is that blamable on the government or the ministry? First of all, the government ought to have protected that enclave. The principle of inviolability. They didn't. The same thing happened with the Nigerians, you remember. And you see, these matters... Mm? And the international law is actually a declaration of war. It's an aggressive conduct. Then don't forget that the sole inquirer has revealed the shenanigans that took place between these actors. And as we speak, government has refused to apprehend Jojo Hagan. I filed an urgent question in parliament. The Attorney General is telling us that they still can't find Jojo Hagan to exert sanctions. Now, as we speak, the Bulgarians are saying that if you can't find Jojo Hagan, then you may have to pay as government. Why? Why, why, why should it be government's business? They, they, they took land from an individual, and issues have come up between two individuals, an owner who gave to another individual, and 
Don't who, forget the role of then, the Lands Commission. Who then disturbed the, the Bulgarian embassy? But there's the role of the Lands Commission. What, what do you mean by government can't <laughs> find him? What, what is government's responsibility in finding him? Government is in charge of internal security. And the recommendation, mm -hmm. if you read the recommendation at page 124, it calls on government mm, at page... At page uh, Pardon me, page 125, rather. Okay. Post on government that Mr. Jojo Hagan should mm -hmm. be sanctioned mm -hmm. for not following due process in the eviction of the alleged trespasses and the demolition of the Bulgarian and the demolition of the Bulgarian embassy building and should be made to compensate the Bulgarian embassy. Right. So what do you find here? Is it a civil process or a criminal process? So when you read these recommendations. It calls on government. It says, for example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, in collaboration with the Lands Commission, should have a clearly spelled out processes for the acquisition of landed properties and their registration by our diplomatic mission based in Ghana. There is the need for the Lands Commission to consolidate its records to avoid the needless confusion caused by the sudden. No, the, the, the recommendation when a sole commissioner makes an inquiry about a property belonging to a private person and then says, government should sanction that private person. How, how do you actually affect it? Because you see, like, uh, he's in public service mm -hmm. and has done something wrong and he's gone through a disciplinary process. How do you sanction me? Government cannot come to me that they are going to sanction me because I gave my land to somebody and then something happened to the property mm -hmm. and a sole inquirer goes into it and says, sanction something. But how do you sanction case, me? In this mm -hmm. case, once the sole inquirer discovered mm -hmm. right. that this private person was working in cahoots with elements at the Lands Commission, his collaborators, who engage in this fraudulent conduct, the government should be taking steps. People at the Lands Commission should be held responsible. Right. So that would be separate. Yes. And you, you and I know that at the Lands Commission, these things happen. People who have influence, should they, should people who have continue? influence, they do all sorts of things at the Lands Commission. Should, is that justified? The fact that it's been happening, mm. should we justify No, it? my question is, how is that interpreted as state capture? Because you have a politically exposed person working with this Jojo Hagan guy, having a clear interest in that property. And indeed, after the demolition, took possession and started building high-rise buildings. <laughs> we had to storm there with the Foreign Affairs Committee to insist that they stop work. And we pushed that this inquiry be set up. I mean, you see, you see how, the, and this is always how it goes. Okay. The, Where politically exposed persons are behind the veil and pulling the strings, <clears> and <throat> they stand to benefit. Mm. Okay. Because in, the, in this case, mm. it's President Kufado's appointee at the NDPC who is the beneficiary of all of these things that have happened. All right. Now, to the next issue about... Parks and gardens. Parks and gardens. Yes. Parks and gardens. Let me start with WA. Again, let me state for the record that this parks and gardens land, it is not true that the sale happened long ago, decades ago, and there's some repackaging. Mm. Indeed, the Honorable Minister himself says that they sold the land in 2019 mm. under very, very dubious circumstances. Very dubious circumstances. Look, I have documents here. Mm from Parks and Gardens wa drawing attention, petitioning the Lands Commission, all the way to the regional minister trying to intervene in March this year, the Lands Commission finally told the, Lands Com the, the, the regional minister to back off. Now, what is so strange about this matter is that you have the minister for local government. I filed an urgent question in parliament. demanding answers to what has happened to the parks and gardens land. And this is what the local government minister told us, the Honorable J. Mm. I'm reading from column 22 of the Hansard of 4th July 2024. Quote, I did indicate earlier that the land in contention is covered by a certificate of allocation dated 27th November 1975 to the state. On the basis of this, we reject the claim by the Regional Lands Commission Indeed, Mr. Speaker, we are not aware as a ministry of any decision by the state to relinquish its interest in the land. 
If that were to be the case, it should have been before this house. On the basis of that, we still believe that the land still holds as a property of government, the Department of Parks and Gardens for that matter, and we intend to reclaim it for the state. This is the local government minister telling us that they have not relinquished their interests. So far as they are concerned, this is still land under their control. And yet the lands minister is saying that they have sold it, they rezoned it, they said that criminals were taking over the parks and gardens land. When you read his statement, if the Republic of Ghana cannot protect its parks and gardens, its green spaces, so, and because you claim that criminals are going there, so again, you, you sell it. And then let me, uh, let me, wait, let me, wait, this, wait on, wait on yes, the wild, wait on the wild parks just, and just, gardens. Uh -huh. Okay, just, just five seconds. Now, that sale and that rezoning is illegal under the Land Use and Spatial Planning Act, 2016, Act 925. Because under Section 93, so you have they, should, the they should have come to, they, to, they should have come to that, Parliament. The question I was going to ask was that uh, November 1973, uh, yeah. that is the acquisition of this land yes. by the state. Then on July 19... Uh, 2019, 2019. one Sidu Muhammad Karim applied for a portion of the land, um, 0.44 acres, and the place was undeveloped, and he got that portion of the land. Now, <coughs> why should the government take any blame about state capture around that subject matter? Thank you for the question. Under Section 93 of the Land Use and Spatial Planning Act 2016, Act 925, says that without limiting subsection 3, the change of use or rezoning of a public space shall be subjected to approval by parliament. This was not done. This was not done. And I have letters here. Look, the Upper West people, they did every day, fought the chair of RECSEC, the regional minister, the Parks and Gardens people, 1st October 2021, they wrote this petition, petition to the regional lands officer, request for your intervention on an ongoing encroachment of our lands, parks and gardens. We write to report to you an ongoing encroachment exercise on our main nursery land gardens along the Kambali Road by an unknown developer. As a custodian of government lands, we'll be very grateful if you could intervene on the matter. So, 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 it, so it, there it was another petition. So, so there was there was a land yes. for parks and for gardens parks and garden. use. Yes, and then. We are told that the place was undeveloped for a very long time. And then an individual wants a part of it. The individual gets a part of it for the purposes of a filling station. station. And we are told now that filling station is leading to the place being put to productive use. Where is the state capture in the question? That's what I want to know. Whether or not the rezoning the policy for the place has changed from parks and gardens to that portion for the purposes of a filling station. Where, where is the state capture in it? Clear state capture. A parks and gardens land that will benefit all of us. When you talk to the parks and gardens, when you read these letters, they disagree, including the local government minister's presentation in parliament. They say that the place was being used as a parks and gardens mm. land to help with our horticultural development, to help with uh, greening our country. They had seedlings and all of that. Now, when a land that will benefit all of us, a green space that will help the quality of life for all of us, and then you go and hive off one for a crony, that is state capture. How, how do you know that Karim I, I know is that, politically I, exposed? I know that for a fact. And if you look at all this, why didn't they follow due process? That is, look, if you look at the, the, the ingredients of state capture, they will not follow due process. Mm. They will deny what is good for all so, of us. So very, very quick things. We'll get to some yeah. of the uh, direct things you are mentioning. Yeah. Uh, you have gone to the WA one, yes. but the one um, at uh, the Cantonment. main one is Cantonment, Cantonment one, yes. where they point to the fact that this was under a visa free anchor, correct? And there was a purpose for it that they were in dire need of office infrastructure and other working tools, and they needed to sell off two acres of the land. And Elvis, you know, gave approval uh, for this to be done. So, where is the state capture in it? I have asked a question, more important question about what they said they wanted to use the proceeds for. They wanted to use it to build an edifice or do something. We don't see anything there. Yes. 
Now, what is emerging from my continuous oversight is that there was really no payment before the NDC left office. And I challenge anybody to produce evidence that these private people had paid anybody. In other words, they did not conclude those discussions that were ongoing. That is the information I have. Okay. Now, I have said in this campaign that I will not hold brief for anybody or defend anybody who has not conducted themselves in a way that is in the interest of the state, whether you belong to my party or not. I have not seen really any conclusive evidence that the parks and gardens land in cantonments were sold. Now, the information that came to my attention was a recent attempt by this developer, a developer called Danny Ike, who I'm told is the second person to have, to have purchased their land after Warren Toomey claims to, uh, to have had that land, even though the evidence is emerging that they did not finalize that transaction. Now, Danny Ike, a few weeks ago, went to place containers on that Parks and Gardens land. And then I got the tip off. I immediately raised alarm and then filed an urgent question in parliament. Because Parks and Gardens is under the local government ministry. I asked the local government minister to come explain exactly what is happening. Because I am interested in making sure that we protect our green spaces, we protect state assets. And I don't care whose ox is God in this campaign. This is what the local government minister told parliament. Quote, in the particular case of the Department of Parks and Gardens land in Cantonments, the recent claimant of the portion of the land indicated that he acquired a title to the land in contention, but could not produce same after he took the matter to court. The court subsequently dismissed the case and requested the plaintiff to re-enter the case with the proper documentation. Mr. Speaker, our checks, however, revealed that the claimant did not have any valid documentation to the land. I wish to state that the land in question has a valid certificate of allocation dated 2nd October 1952 to the Department of Parks and Gardens. Mr. Speaker, the Land Use and Spatial Planning Authority had in 2022 cautioned the general public to stay away from the use of the land for any private development purposes. Pass one to the Land Use and Spatial Planning Act 2016 and its regulations, as well as the Local Governance Act. The usage of green belts, gardens, and parks cannot be altered except through Parliament. In this regard, the Ministry is working closely with LUSPA to ensure that all the developers and citizens adhere to the planning and development per permitting processes under purview. This is what the Local Government Minister told Parliament. Now you have the Lands Minister telling us something entirely different that has been sold. And it was sold by the uh, free Ankara or under the NDC government. Who cares? So my question again, what's the state capture in there? Clear state capture. Parks and gardens, which should help all of us. Faceless elements. So, so you are indicting the NDC government for, for doing this? I'm Except saying, that you are saying by the time you were leaving office, payment had not been made. Had not been made. And so who do you blame? Finalized. So who do you blame? And, and under this government... A new buyer shows up. So NDC was dealing with Warren Toomey. Now, under this government, is Danny Ike. I don't know how the transition was done and who Danny Ike dealt with. Okay. We are still investigating. Hmm. But it's clear that the attempt to take over is happening now, now, under this government. Okay. It is now that these two containers were sent there. And I have had cause to commend the local government minister. Yes. After my question in parliament, the hmm. next day, he moved there got security personnel to move out the containers, All destroy right. the containers. Okay. So, so there are a few elements mm, in this government right. who are acting on, mm. this, who are on the side of the people mm. and, and acting patriotically Be, because of to time, protect because, our status. Because of time, you do this for me. <clears throat> the Dubois Center, Yes. I just need like a minute around it. Yes. You concede that you, uh, you got it wrong there. There's totally nothing to concede about. I have here the transfer agreement. I'll give you a copy. The transfer agreement, which was signed on the 22nd of September 2023 by Shelley Ayokoboche, page 44. Foreign Minister Godfrey Yebo Adami, the Attorney General. A 50-year transfer to 
a private foundation to take over the place, to take total control. Transfer agreement is here. Republic of Ghana, agreement between government of Ghana. So, by so remember you say, you started by saying state capture is important and we shouldn't leave that nomenclature. Exactly. My question is, how do you say this is, how does this make a state, state capture of the Du Bois Center? the Du Bois Center is helping all of us. The proceeds mm -hmm. uh, uh, come to Ghana, yes. you know, under very opaque circumstances. They don't even come to parliament. Then this is transferred to some private entities. And if you read the terms here, very unconscionable. They have total control. Which foundation is this? It was uh, two years ago incorporated. And um, uh, it's... it's, it's, it's uh, I'll, one, I will Mr. come... I'll Mr. come. Jafet Ayiku is uh, supposed to be the chief promoter, you know. And uh, they signed this together with the foreign minister and the local mm. government. And they take total N control. Na name the foundation. What's the name of the, the foundation? The foundation, W.B. Du Bois Museum Foundation. So what, the, what does that tell you? Yes, what does that tell you that there's any state capture in this? Is that W.B. Du Bois Foundation Recently? seeking to mm -hmm. improve the facility <coughs> for the purpose that it's supposed we, we, to be? We shouldn't care Museum about, Foundation. So we shouldn't care about the terms? We shouldn't care about the period? No. Questioning the terms and the period, how does that translate to state capture? Because the terms are unconscionable. They take over two years. You know, they control the place. We, we, they have controlling rights. So, so once again, and who, they control who, the which board. politician is, is lacking in there and seeking to take the state property to themselves so that you can say state capture? You, you, you want full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why you are doing this. Of course, that's why I'm doing this. Okay, we, we're taking, we're, we're, we're taking we're a break that. here. We're taking a break here. When we return, the representative of the minister will, of the ministry, um, will shed some light on these questions with us. But do you find that Okujeto is doing something that is leading you to make some concessions? The minister's statement that he, he gave uh, on the 14th of August at page 8 he said that the Akufuado Baumia government has been meticulous in protecting public lands in the public interest on the 17th of August 2021 with the approval of the president of the republic a policy directive was issued to the lands commission Pass one to Article 25A2 of the National Constitution. To quote, refer all transactions relating to the grant of any interest in public land to the office of the minister for prior approval. This was to ensure that the president of the republic in whom these lands are vested discharges his constitutional duty in an informed manner. The directive further stated that any deed executed without the approval of the president through the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources will be deemed void, as same would have been done without authority of the president in whom the lands are vested. We didn't know about all of this. Now you are telling us that these are the steps you are taking to seek to protect public lands. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And apologies because obviously we cannot do the matter about the security um, recruitment that has come up the NDC accusing uh, the NPP of um, recruiting foot soldiers uh, into the process and actually uh, seeking to bribe, quote unquote, bribe the NDC MPs by asking them to also bring uh, some persons uh, to be giving uh, recruitment or jobs. And now Henry Corte admitting that, yes, they did ask them to do something like that, but it was not intended for bribe. Uh, the question some of my panelists are already asking, including Hen and I, is what is new, really? Don't we know about these things already? So what's going on? Mm -hmm. uh, but the concern has been that two Dankwa Institute guys have been appointed to head or sensitive position in national security. And around the same time, you have um, Brian Champong, 
making all these statements about they will win at all costs and so on. And Brian Champon is linked to the Ayawaso West uh, Wagon uh, situation. So uh, there's some concern ahead of the elections. We certainly will take care of it next time. The show is brought to you by the kindest sponsorship of Bank of Africa, Strong as a Group, and Close Partner, MT, and everywhere you go. Ashesi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Robert and Sons Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care service provider for over 33 years. My Way Insurance, simply dial star 165 hash on MTN to join My Way today. Syntex Tanks, it's strong and it's tough. Flamingo Paint, simply superior. And my outfit, as always, is by Konati Clothing. They are at a dental shopping center, Dental Down. You can contact them on 0244-6767-32. 0244-6767-32. Konati Clothing. What you wear counts. As always, tomorrow join me at 2 p.m. on The Law, my weekly legal clinic. The RTI Law has been in action for how many years now? Uh, it was passed in 2019. So we're going to do some auditing, find out how far, so far, with the Executive Secretary, Yao Sapong Boating. So, uh, Kletus, tell us, the minister has issued statements upon statements, and then he has felt the need to also do a whole uh, broadcast and to repeat the denials that he has made over a period of time. What is Okujeto saying that is not factual? Thank you very much, Samson. <coughs> um, and thank you for the opportunity to just highlight a couple of points. Hmm. I, I will restrain myself strictly to responding to the facts and facts as they relate to the management of lands by the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources and by the Lands Commission. Now, before the break, you made a point which I want to start from that angle, and that is the fact that the expose or so-called expose by the Honorable Member has led to some policy directive. That is not correct. This policy directive started as far back as 2021. In fact, it started immediately when this minister came into office. Now, if you read... Article 2582 uh, two of the Constitution. It says the minister responsible for lands and natural resources may, with the approval of the president. So, first of all, we needed the approval of the president before we could issue these policy directives to the Lands Commission. And so the process started immediately, he came to office, wrote to the office of the president, made some presentations to the office of the president before the approval was given. And the first letter that was written was in 2021, August 17th. That was long before these matters came up. And so it is not as if it is what he is doing that has led to some of these policies. These policies have always been in place and it's been, it's been implemented all along. Now, to the, to the specific matters about the Bulgarian embassy. And Senior, you and I, you know that when you have a document, you have to do a document in full to understand. The Honorable Member makes a lot of allegations about fraudulent, fraudulent, fraudulent. If you read the entirety of the report, which he has, and today I'm happy he said that... Uh, when he wrote, we didn't give him. The last time he was here, he said, we didn't respond to his letter. And in fact, I actually brought a copy of the letter, our response to, to his lawyers, which is, which just... But you didn't the give, that, I said... But you we didn't give, no, didn't the, give the last time he said, we didn't respond to your letter. That was, that was, that was what he said on news for the last time, which we refuted that we responded, except that we gave you reasons why we couldn't give you the report. So that's it. What reason it was, was that? It was an unhelpful response. What I said that, that I want the report, publish the report. What, 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 what the was the reason? Interest. And you the, refused the reason, the reason we gave him was the fact that the report, there were two reasons. First of all, it's a matter bordering on diplomatic mission. So it borders on Ghana's international relations. That is number one. And, and, and under the ITI law, such matters are exempt from the ITI, from disclosure. And number two, the report contains the, the in fact the sole inquiry noted that there are three cases pending in court and some of the witnesses so-called witnesses in this case were interviewed and the case are still pending <clears throat> and so to avoid prejudice we decided to hold on to the report because in fact the 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 the, 
the executive summary of the report, which was published, contains all the findings of the of the Suho inquiry. Mm. If you read the report, about 100 pages of it is actually the evidence of witnesses. And it is that evidence of the witnesses which we said because of the matters pending in court. Okay, so let's of, let's get back. Let's so, get so, back. So, so back to the back to the uh, main issue. But because, the main because issue. I'm a crusader for the RTI, yeah. I am always uncomfortable when people say uh, there is an exemption. Yeah. When the exemption is not blankets. Very well. If the public interest yeah. outweighs that is correct. the the, the danger you, you suspect, the correct. law says you have to disclose it, that, even if it is exempt. That is correct. All right. So let, let me just add mm. that, in fact, in our response to him, mm. we told him that because of these reasons and because of the point you have raised, we had written to the AG for advice on it as to whether we could go ahead to release. Okay. That is in the response we gave to him. You are still waiting so, for so the that, AG's so that's reply. That, Let, let's go so, on. Let's, so, let's so, on. Now, so now, now, now the report. Mm. Now, 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 now on the report. Yeah. The so inquiry's findings of fraudulent was against Mr. Jojo Hagan, not against the last commission. Jojo Hagan, Jojo Hagan, being the one who inherited the land from is Mr. It, his father or whoever his, his, it was. Mr. Mr. Lighten. Right. If you read paragraph 6.13, it said it was found out that Mr. Lighten had acted fraudulently by getting the land registration division of the land commission to cancel the Bulgarian embassy's interest in the land. So the findings of fraud was not against the Lands Commission. And he himself read a, a paragraph which said that the Lands Commission was not diligent. That was, what, that was, that was the sole inquiry's way, yes. that the Lands Commission was not diligent. Hmm. But you see, let me just use that to also explain a little bit. When you, go to, when you go to court and you get a judgment, like the, the Court of Appeal judgment that canceled or that will uh, set aside the high court judgment, you need to plot it at Lands Commission for them to have it on their record. If you do not plot it, they won't have it. So the first high court judgment which was set aside by the High Court, was actually plotted in the Lands Commission's records. But the Court of Appeal decision, up to date, as we speak, is still not plotted. So the Lands Commission, when these documents were presented, had the High Court judgments there, and there was an order for them to cancel, which they, which they complied with. And so, the, 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 yes, the, the so Ankara found that, that the, the High Court the last commission was not diligent. But he never said that they acted fraudulently. Is government the going to be liable? The, it, no. The so Ankara support is very clear. On the last on, on the last recommendation which the honorable member read and it says that mr Dujaga should be sanctioned and made mm. to, to compensate the bulgarian embassy mm. so the person liable for the compensation is mr Dujaga, not government what do you understand by he should be sanctioned sanctioned by who what sort of sanction so so the the report included allegations of fraud against him mm -hmm. and so in the press release which released after the response was published we noted clearly that we had written to the ag to take up the issue of fraud we can't prosecute fraud it is, it is within the remit of... So, there is, so there is crime. Yeah. The, the, That's the, been hinted at. Exactly. A criminal offence. Exactly. And then we have written to the AG to take that up because that is out of our remit. We cannot... And the whole the government can't for. find this guy. For two years. Well, well, well I, as to whether they have found him or not, I am, as a city, I have no idea about that. Okay. But the, 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 if you read the report... I'm asking has, that because, as we understand, the Bulgarians are saying that if you can't find a person, then you have to sort of liquidates the compensation like, like, to them. You must pay. No, like we said in the last, in mm. the last press release we released, there act, there's actually a committee mm. uh, from Lands Commission, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, mm. which are dealing with these matters. Okay. They've settled on the compensation. They have, uh, what, is, what is left in the process for the payment. And, we, we are very and who's, who's going to pay that? From, from the report, it is very clear that Mr. Dudehika is supposed to pay. So you, can, no you, can't find, you can't find him, there so has, who's going to pay? There has been no indication to us that Mr. Dohega is not going to pay this compensation. But you can't find so it. So we are, we are very clear in our mind. Okay. We are very clear now. And I have the Mr. committee's Dojo, report here. Mr. Jojo Hagan is going to pay. 5.3 million. Yes, million. yes. But we, when, when we responded to your press, we admitted the figure. It's not as if it... But what, what the point we were trying, seeking to make was that it's not a liability of government. That was, the, that was all the point we saw. Yeah, but you must that find Jojo Hagan. Yeah, but, that, but, but I'm saying that the, the compensation has been settled on. Mm. The process for the payment is ongoing. There's mm. a committee in place which is dealing specifically with that matter. All right. Now... So, 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 so that is it. And, and, and in fact, and then he mentions, he mentions one doctor, Edu Ampoma. If you read page 11 of the report, it says, with the emphatic admissions regarding the eviction of the so-called trespasses and the demolition of the promises by Mr. Dudu Hagan, the dispute as to who actually did so is finally settled. On the evidence available, the admissions exonerate the developer, Dr. Edu Ampoma, of any blame. And so there's, there's nothing that, as we sit here, we can actually do against Mr. Mr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Iwadu Ampoma. 
because the, the report he himself is referring to is an him and says that Mr. Dodo Hagan should be sanctioned, which is what the process we are, we are following to deal with that. that, that, that he refers to Dr. Duan Poma yes. because he's a politically exposed person. I, I, I don't know him. And, and, and he benefits I have, from I have, I have no, I, have, I don't know him. He came but, to but from, 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 from the report, from the report, the demolition was done. In fact, it was subsequent to the demolition that he acquired the property. And that is why the Sue and Karachule is on earth him. I don't know him. I don't know. He acquired it after the demolition. After the demolition. That is true. So it's not that he was lurking around no, and he's the one who the, instigated the, the demolition. The Sue and Kwara says that mm. it was after the demolition that the uh, Jojo Hagan assigned the residue of his interest okay. to Dr. <coughs> Dr. Dr. All right. Okay. Now, the, the, the issue, I, I see that you are looking at the time. Yes. There, there are a couple of other issues mm. raised, which mm. I want to respond to briefly. The issue about the Parks and Gardens Land Act. The last commission doesn't do rezoning. That is solely in the remit of the LUSPA, which is under the uh, local government. Yeah. And so the processes that they go through to rezone, last commission is not involved. But when, they ha when they have rezoned the land, then based on that, they, then the land commission can make some allocations for certain developments. And so as to whether the LUSPA complied with the law for rezoning or they didn't comply with the law, that is actually out of our remit. Mm. But we have been informed, the last commission was informed by the, by the, the uh, regional LUSPA in Upper West region that this particular area has been rezoned and, gave, and specifically gave approval for the construction of a filling station. Mm. And it was based on this <coughs> that, the, that the, the, the last commission went ahead to give the, the list that, that, to... That, that, but you will understand, you will understand, you understand, you you understand Nokujeto somewhat mm -hmm. uh, that... Yes, this is paperwork, yeah. but we have known situations where the zoning policy for a particular area yeah. overnight changes yeah. because one politically exposed person yeah. wants to have access to yeah. a particular portion or has gotten a portion but cannot use it for the purpose for which he has gotten it. And suddenly there's a rezoning. Yeah. Senior, like and a, in like, addition like to like that, a, they didn't comply all, all with all the law. They didn't and come to parliament. Like, a, like, a, like I indicated from the beginning, I am to myself to the facts I understand you. which are within mm. the remit of the mm. Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources and okay. the Lands Commission. Mm. I, I can't go into the intent, intent of other people and all those stuff. Mm. But what I'm saying but is don't that... But don't saying, you have a duty to check? Wait, what if Lusba tells that, you that we have reasoned, <laughs> don't you have a duty to check if, <laughs> they, have, if they have actually reasoned and if they follow the process? Yeah. Senior, you are now aware that official acts are presumed to have been properly done. Unless you have contrary evidence, when Lusba writes to us that they have reasoned this area, why should we go and question Lusba? Do you have the loose palette? Yes, I have the loose palette. I have the loose palette here. I'm here. I have, I have the loose palette. I have the loose. Yeah, because you see, there, I, I don't question your intention. Your intention uh, how about how about the very, how about the how about the Dubai uh, Dubai, Dubai, Dubai Center? Center. I, don't know. I, I was asking you to for him to read the title of the document he's reading. I have no privy to. Okay. The Lands Commission is the repository of lands. The AG doesn't sign land uh, transfer of deeds. The Foreign Minister doesn't sign transfer of deeds. When you are given a, a lease of a public land, it says the, the president of the Republic of Ghana, acting by the chairman of the Lands Commission, or an officer of the Lands Commission. The Lands Commission says they do not even have an application. They do not even have an application for a transfer of that particular land, as we speak. That document you are referring to, it can be a deed of transfer of the land. It can be. So, if it, so if it, if it is an as far as... Yes, yes. if it is an arrangement as, between some parties... As far as, your ministry, as far as your ministry is concerned... That land is still intact. There's no issue of state capture in any of the uh, matters he has raised. Not, not at all. In fact, and, and in fact, that is, that, is, that is the point that we sought to make. He... he and, and strictly restricting ourselves to the issues of the lands that he raised. For example, the issue about the cantonments Cantonments, uh, passing garden last year. That I have the deed of uh, the, the deed of uh, convenience here, dated dated 20, 2016. and 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 he says that his checks indicate that they are, they were not paid. That can't be true. And and when the person have, has give, changed. No, yes. Before you give before you give a land, let me address and I will address your point. Before the, the you are given a public land, they give an allocation. The allocation contains conditions about how much you should pay and everything. Until you pay that, Lands Commission will never execute a deed for you. Until you make that payment, Lands Commission will never execute a deed for you. That's true. And so it can be true that they have issued a deed when it has not been paid. Payment was made. 
and it was based on that payment that they did was issued. So those who are saying that to him are misleading. They're, 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 okay. they're, they're obviously so, misleading. So how come, and they save, so how come, and they save, how come in 2021, yeah. the Ministry for Local Government and Rural Development went yeah. to that same location so, so, to build a five-story? So, so let me explain this. A five-story building. Okay, very quickly. Let's, and let's, and let's, let's, let's explain that. This letter of Sammy, 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 I gave you Sammy, all the budget. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead and explain. The land at the Parks and Garden Lands at Cantonments is more than two acres. It is only two acres of this that was granted to this company. And so the other portions of the land, which are over 10 acres, is still there. The Ministry of Local Government could have gone there to develop the other part of the land, mm. not, necessarily this particular, are you aware? not necessarily this particular land. Okay. So the fact that the Ministry wanted to go and build something there is mm. not, it's not as if it was on that specific but, but land. Okay. Are, you aware? Now, now, let me, are you aware? Let me, let me, let me respond to you. No, no, hold on. No, 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 Sammy, hold on. Sammy, hold on. Sammy, hold on. Sammy, hold on. And quickly do in two minutes for me. I need... Nanaya and um, Dr. Tio Champo, at least to have a minute's commentary. Yeah. Ah, but that would uh, be uh, unfair, Sam. Uh, <laughs> yes, quick. I also have some uh, responses uh, to that. Yes, uh, I, I understand you can do a minute. Conclude. Yes. So, mm. so, 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 the, so the point, and, 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 and uh, the last question, he, he, I mean, the last matter he mentioned is the issue about the, what do you call it, the judges bangalows. That I, have also, I also have a deed here. Before that, the issue about uh, I, Ike, Something, something, which mm. he mentioned. Yeah, Danny Ike. Danny. Yes, Dan, Danny Ike, I have here an application by the Wintrim people dated 6 January 2020. Sorry, 6 January 2017. 6 January 2017, before this government came to power. 6 January. And it was granted for, that day. No, they applied for consent to, to transfer this land to this Danny Ike people. And the last commission granted granted the the, the consent. Yeah, so he raised the issue of the transfer, so, yeah, so, and it was not done within this government. That's the point you are making. Exactly. In January, exactly. on the sixth of exactly. January, before and, the seventh yes. of January. Yeah. Okay. And then and then and then and then the issue about the the, the judges bungalows. I mean that that matter have been we've tried to restrain ourselves from going to the table because it's, it's, it's a matter of in court. In court. Okay. Fact, the, the CJ himself have taken mm. interest to try All right. try and resolve the okay. matter. But the, but the fact mm. remains that. The land was granted in 2015. Okay. And, 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 and uh, when he's making a demand for the minister to publish, he's making a demand for the minister to publish the list yes. of the yes, making this demand. allocations. Yes. When is he going to do that? We were, we were before his committee, the assurance committee. Yeah. Just a couple of weeks ago. Right. And, 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 and in fact, this same matter came up, and we've assured him that the the the. the it, you, it is, you see, you've been assuring us since February. No, no, no. When, no. Are when are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? So, so, that, so, that, so the assurance the minister gave to the committee, and I believe is the same thing, which, which I can repeat here, mm. is the fact that the team at Lands Commission is putting the thing together. Right. They say because it is manual, mm. it is very difficult. And, okay. and, 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 and so. And you have decided that you are going as far back as uh, 1993. 1993. Thank we, you we, very we, much. Na, Anaya, please, you have to forgive us. You have to forgive us. Uh, what can you say about this back and forth? I mean, I don't understand this back and forth. Yeah. The point is that state capture is state capture, whether whoever has done it. You see, the biggest state capture is the National Cathedral lands. The president made the private um, promise to God, and he's used state lands trying to build a National Cathedral. That is state capture. You see, when the minister was speaking, he said that... With the land, you, you have gifts, compulsory acquisition, chiefs, um, stools, skins, and all that. But compulsory acquisition and gifts, you don't give them out. Mm. Because you, you acquire them for some developmental process. I'll give an example of free... Okay, I, I'm very sorry. I apologize to you most profusely. And we will have you back. I'm very sorry. And... Uh, of course, there is a bipartisan support for Okujeto's bill to prohibit uh, public, uh, publicly exposed persons from acquiring uh, public lands. My guests have been Kletus um, Alenga, who is Legal Counsel, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. Uh, Dr. Theo Champong, apologies to you once again on this subject. Economist and political risk analyst Nanaya Achempim Jantua is former general secretary of the Convention People's Party and Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, son of man, MP for North Tong and chairman, Assurance Committee of Parliament and Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament. I'm Samson Ladia Yenini. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.